invited me here, and I propose that we do this panel. Actually, we didn't know each other before, so we just came out with, with some ideas on how to do this panel. So the idea is to have a more conversational part after the talk. So right now, I'm going to start, and then you will have a presentation on their slides, and then we're going to have, say, 20 minutes to question and answer among what we are doing. Uh, and so I'm, I'm Zoe, I, I work for Arduino, I, I take care of uh, digital strategy and uh, wearables. I started this year to work for them, my background is not technological and it's more like philosophical social movement and DIY, and especially in the last year I've been working on open design and, and craft. On, some European projects and some other local stuff in Italy. Today, I'm, I'm going to talk about how I see these three things going together, how wearable, all the technological innovation has coming up in the last years, how DIY and, and, and the idea of empowerment of people is actually uh, uh, coming up, and how we can think of new projects and new challenges coming up in the next years. As we see, as we've seen today in the panel of this morning, I uh, hope you were here with us today. We've been uh, one thing came out very strongly: the fact that wearable technology is the next big thing in uh, the tech industries. And this usually wearable technology has this, let's say, uh, very broad definition of how we can incorporate, uh, including uh, and accessories, computers and uh, tech. And usually. The development is being done in this type of uh, um, sectors, like the well-being, uh, healthcare, but also uh, art, uh, but also social networking and environment. And, uh, we have different type of projects. We have a project that comes directly from big companies, but we have a lot of bottom-up innovation because there were a lot of tools that uh, allow people to enter an experiment with with tech without having a background of engineering. For example, one of the main aims of Arduino is doing this thing. And sometimes when people play with this, they don't realize, they don't think if these things are open or closed, if the hardware they're using is open source or not, if the software is, uh, is something that is uh, replicable or not, if the data that actually you are collecting out of your wearable is open source or not, if it's collected from some company or is something that everyone can access to. So there is a kind of polarization that on one side we see big companies, big investments and uh, with usually closed projects uh, that have a really small, uh, small uh, devices that you can wear and it's opaque because actually you don't know what's inside, which sensors are inside or you you go to like fix it or, and you open it up and, and see what's going on. And usually it's about personal empowerment. And if you wear this, you can collect data about yourself and it, you can improve your well-being. On the other side, we have some kind of more uh, orientation on problem solving, on uh, sharing things, on uh, understanding and being transparent about the process of creating things. And usually this comes from the DIY to do together background, what happens in tablets, makerspace, spaces like that. And uh, if we see at the power market oriented area, we have a lot of, uh, last year they sold 8 million units of uh, uh, small devices that track your data. And in the next, uh, they, they forecast that by 2017 we will have like 64 million units of these uh, little wearable devices collecting data out of us. And then forecasters say that the market will, will reach like 50 billion dollars in the next years. So it's something that, why, how happened, how come this big thing? Um, the, this, um, let's say that the, the fathers or the, let's say the, um, the initiators of this concept of personal empowerment were these two guys from Wired magazine that 
created the, this quantify sense movement, saying that if we keep tracking and understanding how our body works, uh, we can actually, with little uh, uh, effort, we can really prove the way we live. And, uh, and what what is happening now with this data collected, we, we, we have the idea what's happening now with our mobile devices. We have that. We have mobile devices that collect data, and this data is collected by big companies, and these big companies use big data to understand and forecast behaviors and give you the right product to the right person or giving the right advertisement to the right person. I mean, there is all this insight for decision making. And uh, we see that also they use this information also for uh, take care and to understand what is our behavior. This data is used, for example, for credit card the company to decide if to give you a credit card or if to give you a, a, a health plan or if uh, uh, you did something and you share too much <coughs> stuff on your social networks, they decide that you're not fit, you don't fit for the job because you, you said the wrong thing. So in a way, uh, there is all this micro, also this uh, software coming up. This last one I, I ran into was Peak that allows micromanaging. It says that you have software on your computer and the software uh, and the calculates how much time you spend on GitHub, on Google Doc, on which documents, and then sends daily reports to your boss. So he doesn't have to ask you every day what are you doing, but there is a software that is sent to him on what you're doing and in which way you've been uh, uh, comfortable. To him. So, uh, so what happened with wearables? With wearables, it's the same thing. It's about collecting data because most of the big companies are investing on that, giving cheap devices to a lot of people to collect data. And, and next to the behavioral data, what you do in Facebook, Twitter, or on LinkedIn, or whatever, there will be a lot of value data. It means your heartbeat, your uh, sleep, uh, how, ma how long are you, do you sleep every night, how uh, how much do you move? And so, in a, in a way, it's uh, sometimes I also found some weird news that uh, in February there was this uh, Tesco guy who denounced the fact that Tesco was making him wear a uh, uh, wristband to control actually his work. They told him it was for logistics uh, to improve the way he was moving around the, the warehouse, but actually. It also measured uh, how, how uh, effective was the uh, way of working. The same thing, an undercover journalist went to work in Amazon warehouse and, and he, he had this handheld and every 33 seconds he had to do one action. And if that was not done good, uh, they had a score that was not uh, that was uh, low, and so the yeah, consequences of that. <coughs> and so, in, in which way all the data that then we are providing to, to these companies are going to, when we will be obliged to wear a Fitbit to have an insurance plan? Or uh, this guy from, uh, I found this cool news saying, this data mining CEO says that he pays the bills of junk food, not with a credit card, but just in cash, because he doesn't want to track to make people uh, track or companies or other people know that he's eating trash food. So, I mean, this is something that you can think about. So, uh, what, what, what all this has to do with, uh, has to do with uh, empowerment and DIY? Actually, in which way we can use all, everything that comes from open source movement to DIY to actually uh, use this technology uh, that are cheaper and more available to us in a, in, a, in a way that makes us more powerful in doing things for the collective good or for our uh, needs. So that if we saw that everything that comes from the DIY open source starts from the communities, communities <coughs> that every day work about problem solving, finding ideas, and usually this type of activities are licensed to Creative Commons or other type of licenses that allow the people to use this also for um, 
creating companies. So you have facilities coming up, you have kids <coughs> coming out, you have a spread. If you see the history of uh, RepRap, the open source uh, um, 3D printer, you see there is one starting point and then a lot of spread, spreading of the um, a lot of 3D printer projects. Some of them are, are for profit, some other are, are not for profit, but that's the good thing of open source. So we have uh, if you see that Arduino is a, is a platform that is allowing people to actually access the, the possibility to create wearables and create technology and understand how these things work. And it's not about the, the, the hardware. It's actually the, one of the three important things of Arduino is about the hardware, yes, but also the community of people problem solving things online and and, and, and finding solutions and sharing code. And the, 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 the third thing is about uh, being able to produce documentation that is understandable uh, by people without a engineering background. So these are the big efforts that are really looking at the And we have other example of uh, uh, open source uh, that is empowering uh, small producers, for example, this, this Kickstarter project on the uh, Jacquard loom that was kickstarted some years ago, and actually uh, a normal uh, Jacquard loom costs around 50,000 euros. This one will cost around 2,000 uh, dollars, and so small fab labs and um, hackerspace could use it to create uh, textile like uh, J Ria J and uh, and then we have other open source projects like the Solar Fiber. A group of people from Netherlands are working on this fiber that actually will be released in open source and uh, save energy to empower, to give uh, uh, electricity to your um, like a battery, okay, to your wearable. And then we have. A lot of shared knowledge, for example, how to get what you want is a website of two friends of mine, uh, Suzea and Mika, that they are sharing everything they do with cool documentation and all the code. This is actually allowing people to experiment and understand how to do things in wearables. Also, the other food learning system and Lilipon, for example, for uh, the Lilipon, the platform for wearables. But so, in which way we can uh, uh, we can start in this, usually in this world of DIY, we start with an idea, and this idea can be uh, shared through the sharing code, sharing something that is material, the instructions, but then if this goes well, you can also spread and sell the kit to people to make them themselves, and then if it goes well, then it's really modular. You can start producing the real product in general. Engineering it, and then you can create maybe a mass product, and then produce also the uh, collector, uh, the collector of product, uh, where you source the best material and you source the way of doing it that is the maximum benefit for, for, the, for the object. And uh, in, uh, in Adding all this stuff together, we can find the collectives and little companies coming up with uh, great ideas about how to empower and solve problems from the bottom-up perspective. This project it was called Ground Lab, and they created a, a color using all open source uh, technology and uh, because there was a problem of lions being killed by Masai uh, having their sheep. Uh, they didn't want their sheep to be eaten by uh, by lions, so the lions were wearing this color and send an SMS every time the lion was coming close to the sheep, and so it, it could actually save both the, the subjects. Mm -hmm. this, uh, thing. Then the last example I wanted to do, and I think it collects back to what I said before about data. If we see this project about the open source uh, uh, Geiger, uh, this tool is an open source project and it was created in 2011 and allowed people to measure the nuclear radiation of your environment. So it was done by a group of uh, uh, activists, technical guys, that said we feel the responsibility of providing our support in those areas where we can contribute and they release it in open source and the, the, the year after there was a huge Kickstarter 
to create, in collaboration with Safecast, to create this open source uh, uh, hardware <coughs> and uh, a platform uh, connected with the platform that was collecting data from uh, the territory of Japan after the big uh, accident, nuclear accident uh, in those years. So the thing is that with <coughs> having all this uh, open source hardware measuring Geiger and nuclear radiation, the population could provide uh, in this platform data that actually um, went against the government of Japan because they were producing and distributing knowledge about the data that was wrong, was not right. Actually, the, the level of radiation was higher, and, but the, the government was not giving the, 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 the right information to the population. So actually, this open source project allowed a lot of people, actually a whole population, to really measure what was going on in their city. So in which way this type of thinking, in which way open hardware together with open software and us as people that will use these tools can collect this type of data on which platform, how can we go on and, and do these things together. Now there are you no know, solutions, I don't see yet. Uh, I mean, for example, this Geiger thing is the only project that I found that uh, adds all these things together. But I, I'm curious to know if some of you know about projects that do all this triangle of information. And uh, thank you very much. And, uh, uh, you in areas that usually are found separated or being opposites. So I was a um, wearable technology researcher at the MIT Media Lab when they had their base in Dublin. Um, but also I have a master's from Central St. Martins, which is called Textile Futures. And um, I think the way I see it now, many years after, is that that has given me the capability of having what I believe the most important two aspects of design, which is to have the means, but also the meaning. So I like my work to be very strong in the use of the means of producing things, ideas, uh, but also that the ideas are strong in their meaning. Um, as a freelancer, I have worked in many projects. I'm just gonna go very quickly. This is for Cadbury, but it was a collaboration with Fusion Man. And you can see here we're using Arduinos, LEDs, embroidery, um, well, digital embroidery in this case, and a lot of uh, handwork. There is always still, I think we all know, wearable technology is not yet at the point where everything can be just mass produced just like that. So there is a lot of um, attention to detail, um, what you would call couture techniques incorporated into how to make these technologies um, look aesthetically right. Um, for a fashion environment. Uh, this is actually designing the animations that were going to be projected on the dresses for the closure ceremony of the Olympics. So this was a project for Brazil. Done, um, I was working with uh, Moritz <coughs> uh, This is a project for Hugo Boss, which is a full uh, battlefront LED suit um, done with marshmallows laser key. Uh, this is a project done with uh, Jason Moon Studio, which is we had to create this inflatable cloud that illuminated and bred 
so we kind of inflated and deinflated, so we had integrated funds and a little bit of programming in it. Um, so we were doing this cloud and I was doing um, the electronics and also the textile part, uh, but as you can see, I incorporated some reflective materials in a way that it has like secret patterns that you can only see when um, when people go in front of the statue. It's a four meter massive wooden penis. Um, so when you go in front of it and you take a, the typical tourist picture, you have hidden patterns inside of the, of the textile as well. Um, so that one is in Dublin. And then this was also an illuminating hat for Nelson at Trafalgar Square in the Olympics as well. So somehow, as a freelance, I think I find it quite fun. But yeah, I find myself doing very different projects here and there. And um, it's very interesting, but it's in the in a way, it's in this DIY side of wearable technologies. That's one part of what I do. So um, when I have to introduce myself, it's very hard today. When you say you're a designer, that could be anything. And especially lately, people think that means you do web stuff or virtual stuff. It's not any more you produce or you make things. Uh, so I say I'm a technology artisan, which I don't know if it helps <laughs> to get a sense of what I do, but that's what I say. Um, and I think because this, this work has both what I was saying before, the technology that means, but then what I do, I try to give it a lot of meaning. And I think that's what the artisan had. And I think it's the industrial revolution in a way what has taken that away from us. Not only that we no longer know how things are made and we no longer have these skills, but also we don't have this connection with the people that are making the stuff that we had before. We knew that we knew who they were. We care for them, we understood why things have a certain price, which is a big problem today. We try to price something and nobody, you know, people just really want to push it down because there is, there is not this transparency or connection with the people that actually make products. So, the means, I divide it in three parts and I think as a designer, um, the strength of your work relates to the strength of your knowledge in the materials you work with, the tools you're going to need, and the skills to use those materials and those tools to make something possible. Um, in the fashion environment, a very simple example is if you want to do knitwear, you need to know about wools, you need to know, let's say it's handmade, so you only need to know about, I don't know how you call it in English, the knitting, knitting bags. Um, and then you need to have the materials, the tools, and the skill to put this together. But there is something else that is very intriguing for me as well, which is actually there is not only that. Before, people had access and knowledge for technologies in, the, in their time. It was a technology. So, and this is a woman. So actually, I find that what wearable technology brings us is as well a way of bridging gender gaps, I call it. Bridging. Um, so yeah, I'm very interested in how actually wearable technologies, of course, give us empowerment when we learn to do them ourselves, but also it, it does bridge this, this massive gender gap of what women do, what men do, what women are supposed to know, what men are supposed to know. So yeah, there you go. She knew how to work this material from scratch. She knew this technology and that was part of her everyday life. If I compare it to what it will be the knitwear of the future, or well, this exists already, so it's not, it's not the future. But let's say 3D printing, yeah? So you can make a knit-like material, like a chain-like material with a 3D printer. The, the materials you will need to understand to build this yourself is more of a skill of a chemist, maybe. Uh, the tools will be more uh, of an engineer. Um, and the skill to use these tools and these materials and build what you want um, is more of a mathematician, programmer, coder, etc. So today it's just much harder and that's why I believe technology and craft are so far apart is that it's much harder that one unique person will have a full knowledge for all of these three areas. So I think today when things are truly possible is because there are collaborations. And that's what I do most of the time. I'm involved in actually quite a large team. I don't think I've ever was in a team less than eight people. Let's say that's kind of the, the average for, for any brand that will contact us to, to develop a product. 
Um, and then not only collaborating, but trying to build up teams that are multidisciplinary. And I think that's where now um, we are in a very privileged uh, time that we can do this. You can be a designer one day and then explore these other things that intrigue you um, working with other people. It's not the first time that happens in history. This is the, the domestication of the sewing machines. The sewing machines were designed uh, for industrial purposes only, and then it grew into an interest to have it in the home. So artists uh, had to work together with engineers to make appealing uh, sewing machines for the style of, of the time. Till today, all of the kind of very, um, well, these are especially for sports and health. Um, but yeah, these are teams of of engineers and doctors working together. It's not just one unique person that it is. Um, I really like to look a lot, not only into the integration of technologies, but also into materials and biomimetics is one of the uh, strongest areas of material research, which is to imitate what is already in nature. And I'll go back to the other slide. I think something very interesting about wearable technology is not only that, um, it can make us, well, give some people capabilities that they unfortunately don't have, but also that technologies can give humans in general capabilities that nature gave to other animals, for example. Better intuition, better knowledge of ourselves, better knowledge about just um, the world in, in general, what's happening anywhere else. Um, so something I think the strongest thing I learned at the MIT from Nicolas Negroponte, is that um, he made us understand that everything is possible. So whenever we started a project, that was the initial point of the project. Anything is possible, forget what technologies you're gonna use. At the beginning, we just didn't know, and that was the point, to not know, was just to have this sky vision, blue sky vision that anything was possible. So he said, today, Honestly, you could believe you have all the means in the world because we can connect with anyone. Um, but then if everything is possible, he said what I want you to focus is, what is it that truly matters? If you're gonna build something, what is it that truly matters to build today? And that is what I would call the meaning. So as a designer, I think those are the two strong points you need to have, meaning and means and meaning. So there's this book that I find very interesting in design activism, and uh, basically um, it's about this. It's about um, how being a designer means that you have a, a duty of actively um, affect people around you. If you do a product and a lot of people consume this product, you are affecting how this product behaves in the daily life, and we see that with. Um, I don't know, smartphones that have changed everybody's, everybody's life and, and the world. So um, any product can have that potential. So that's not only your duty, but it's like a privilege, I believe. Uh, and then if we move forward, design activism now is, is lately called design hacktivism. And this is probably what we're going to discuss today, the whole DIY area, which means that not only you can design uh, products that will affect people positively in the world, but you can design products that people <coughs> can then um, customize or hack for their own for their own specific needs, and that has a, a lot of consequences, not only for the empowerment of yourself being more independent uh, in a community or independent even from other countries, <coughs> um, but um, well, I'll pass to the next slide. Um, I have to finish them yet. So I'll just go uh, very fast. This is one of the products I developed. Uh, it's just a very simple textile smart materials kit that will teach you electronics, but because it's a cuddly, cute little monster, it's actually unisex. Both boys and girls love building this and, and playing with it. Um, it's called the kit. Um, then a simple, a very, very simple thing that, that we do is, this is just a funny slide, it says imagine you're getting married and you forgot to tweet about it. Um, maybe you needed to have augmented your gloves. So we just teach people something very basic, which is how you can use conductive threads to make any pair of gloves um, and a smart glove. Instead of having to, to 
many times buy things that other people are producing and probably it's not what you like. This is, <coughs> this is using sourcemap.org, so you can track every single part of a product, where it comes from, and how it finally gets into your door. Um, unfortunately, most of the time after that, it ends up here. Um, so this is a very strong part where DIY can avoid products ending up here because they are truly the products that you really need. And not only that, but in the terms when I do uh, workshops with children, the toys they develop themselves, they will keep longer. And we all know how quickly children get bored of toys and parents just keep throwing things away. So here, yeah, one, another very important part of DIY is avoiding, avoiding that the things we produce will end up here. Um, I will just mention these all technologies combined with our number of made as collectively a force of nature. Um, so I'll just show the next slides almost without talking. This is a, a project about solar power technology and investigating how would these products look if we use very delicate and feminine and antique materials. Um, another project I'm working on is for global warming awareness. And it's, a, it's more about material. This one doesn't have electronics. Um, and it's to support uh, the Melanoma Research Alliance. It's called a colorium, and it's uh, a stone that we have developed that it looks very much like like food bars. It's called albedonite, and uh, it's a stone that is white, and then in the sunshine it's, it's pink. Then you have some pictures of the growing process of the stone. Um, And um, okay, so that's a jewelry collection. And then um, I have a brand specializing on uh, reflective material and reflective footwear. Um, <coughs> <laughs> Um, I'm a researcher in residence in Fabrica, which is in Piso, Italy, and we're actually from the States. Um, I'm going to talk about a, sort of a specific area of computational fashion that nobody has touched on. So anyways, uh, at Fabrica, my focus is where I'm going computational fashion and open source pattern making. Um, I'm talking about Open Fit, which is a project that I developed in New York at the beginning of the summer. Um, in collaboration with an artist and coder, coder named Kyle McDonald. And it's the project that I developed right before I moved to Italy. Um, I'm also going to be exhibiting in the Futures 10 tomorrow, so, and I can't talk about that project yet, but hopefully you'll be here tomorrow and you'll come to the opening, because I'm quite excited to share it. It's for Caitlin Morris, who's sitting right there, who's also a topic up with me. So anyways, um, so I have a mixed background. Um, I did a research, uh, a research fellowship for a year where I traveled to developing countries and I was writing about um, basically like the context that people use technology and how the sort of access to technology and the prevailing cultural conditions like um, sort of, um, sorry, they sort of inform the type of work that people do. So one is like the sort of like anthropological research in developing countries. And then the other is I've also worked as a handcrafted shoemaker and a cobbler, a cobbler and I used to sell my own clothes, so I've also worked as a pattern maker before. And um, while I was on my fellowship year living with a collective in Indonesia, I ran into the whole idea of Fab Labs. And I got pretty excited, and Kyle is an artist that I actually met also while traveling, while working in a residency in Spain. And so I told him I was learning so much about digital fabrication, and I had this vision of this sort of like one hour photo, but for custom clothing, where you could basically walk in, you could get scanned, you could get a custom pattern made and fabricated for you on the spot. And would that be possible? Uh, we had an email conversation about this in 2011, 
um, two years later, at the beginning of this year, we were in Germany, and we happened to run into each other at a conference, and he was like, hey, whatever happened to that idea you emailed me about? <coughs> and I was like, well, I'm, actually, I'm still really interested in this, and he was like, okay, let's do this. So um, in two months, we put this together, and um, we basically, we broke it down into four steps. Basically, there is the computer vision aspect, so you have to scan somebody in order to get their very precise measurements. You also have to make them a pattern. Then you also have to find some sort of cutting system. I mean, I, there's a lot of um, excitement about like CAD systems and laser cutting right now. And then you also just have to sew the pants. So, um, <coughs> so we actually realized that the second step of this problem, this process, posed very unique problems, and there were some interesting challenges. Um, for one, commercial patterns for home sewers are very limited stylistically and they're often not well built fit. Um, also, pattern CAD systems, they're very expensive and they're very inaccessible to the average user or like a small time designer. Um, they run at the thousands of dollars. Um, and then there's also the question of just the pattern making skills themselves. Um, it's basically, it's sort of a tacit knowledge and tacit knowledge being a, like a knowledge that can't really be um, documented or shared very easily. It's often something like very physical or involves like a series of judgment calls that are very hard to document. And so I worked with a professional pattern maker in New York City to develop this project. And she even told me that going to four years of fashion school, she didn't even touch on pattern making at all. They only did draping. And that the only pattern making knowledge that she's gotten has been working with a master pattern maker who actually is teaching her all these kind of archaic rules that are very undocumented still. Um, even despite having this experience and um, opportunity to work with a master pattern maker, the process of pattern making is still subject to passes of trial and error. And there's not really a good way to analyze what works and what doesn't and reducing these passes of trial and error. So. Um, there's also this thing called a sloper. So basically, this is a pant sloper. This is taken from a tailoring manual. And the idea of a sloper is that it's like a very basic clothing pattern that you base your other designs off of. Um, what's really interesting is that all of the algorithms to create slopers are very varied. Some of them are proprietary. Some of them have the most um, arbitrary rules, like you have to step over five centimeters, then go up an angle of 20 degrees, and then step over six centimeters in this direction. And honestly, I don't even know where these rules come from, and there's no explanation for them. It's just a manual of steps that don't make sense. And what's really interesting is I talked to another professional pattern maker who told me that these algorithms to create clothing are also limited to the region and the ethnicity. Um, of the people who use them. So, because there's also sort of a sweet spot for a sloper. If you're given a series of measurements and then a series of geometric rules to plot these measurements, there's sort of a sweet spot of measurements where they work really well. And then like the edge cases, they get more and more distorted. So, um, then there's another issue on top of this, is that pattern grading, which is the step after you've drafted your design, it's where it's sized for other for like three sizes up and three sizes down. And usually the way they do that is they just like plot offsets. So just like sort of concentric lines outside of that and inside of it. But that naturally causes distortion. So if you were grading a collar and you draw lines on the outside of the collar, it's gonna actually make smaller collar lines. Whereas if you were um, actually taking the piece that goes around the collar and you grade around that, it actually creates um, bigger sewing lines. So actually the pattern grading, it doesn't usually match up and then you have to do all these other things to fudge them together. So um, ultimately, we started asking ourselves, why are technical design, like these sort of um, technical issues with pattern making, why are these so separated from fashion design? Because if the perception of how a piece of clothing fits determines how fashionable a user perceives a garment, why should these practices be disparate? So we decided to create a, an open source um, entry point for a technology and a practice that is unnecessarily inaccessible to creative people. So um, we went through a, a variety of explorations, which essentially amounted to me staring at butts for a month. 
and <laughs> um, I tried to plot them in 2D, I tried to plot them in 3D, and it's just, it's really funny because the same place in this, where there is some very interesting like geometric ambiguities, actually when we tried to plot the exact same thing in three dimensions, there is a place in the mesh right in the crotch where the vertices didn't align. So it's interesting to know that these issues in FIT carry over in multiple dimensions, in totally different softwares, and totally different algorithms. And when you try in a pair of pants, probably the place where they don't fit is in the crotch because it's like very geometrically complex to create, which I found out in detail. <laughs> so anyways, we cre created a system. Um, we basically came up with a system with 15 different measurements, and we plotted the pants according to these measurements. Um, right now, everything is just manually adjusted within a GUI. This is written in processing. I wrote a GUI so you can actually go through and manually adjust everything. We have three different sets of lines. The red ones are plotting your body, and then the black lines plot the pants around your body. And actually, um, I've started to figure out the ease calculations, so like how far inside of your body or outside of your body the um, black line should be, depending on what kind of fabric you want, what kind of fit you want. And so then, after I wrote the software, Kyle also came up with a amazing <coughs> body scanning system in a week, which I don't know how he hacked this together, but basically we threw a party where we gave our, our friends a bunch of alcohol, because they had to <laughs> change into chroma key green, very, very tight leggings, and stand in front of a connect. We scanned them. He exported these measurements and gave them to me. I ran them through processing. Um, we decided to do this like um, all on our own, so we didn't have a laser cutter at the time, so we actually projected everything to scale. And Caitlin showed up and was wonderfully helpful at like chopping the patterns and cutting them out. And we ended up making six pairs of pants for people on the spot in a gallery. So that was really exciting. And okay, so just to finish up. Um, so this spring we're hoping to expand this into a toolkit for 2D drafting. Those are a pair of pants that we made in the lab that can be used by both by coder coders, pattern makers, and designers. And it's simple enough for non-coders to pick up as well. So a place where both the traditional and computational techniques can mesh. Um, our, our long-term goal is to eventually explore creating accurate 3D meshes and unwrapping them. Um, we're also looking for input from people, pattern makers, designers, and coders about what sort of things they would want this software to do. Um, recently, we received a slightly aggressive email from a pattern maker saying that pattern makers and CAD developers have been trying to create new solutions for years without success. Like, who are we to think that we can solve this? And <laughs> the whole idea is because it's collaboratively driven and not user-driven, and not like, I'm sorry, <coughs> collaborative and user driven and not industry deliver driven, um, I think we can have the opportunity to create these very new solutions that work well. And <clears throat> it's basically, in conclusion, it's amazing that a basic collection of knowledge, which are the geometric rules that govern the way the clothing that we wear every day fits, it's still so esoteric and traditionally constrained. So hopefully we can try to open this up a bit. Thank you. But anyway, um, I'm going to talk about visualising data, and um, I'm going to uh, show you two examples of my work. Um, so hello, so hello everybody. Uh, my name is Ray Ashford. Um, I create wearable technology and artworks. Um, here's a slide with a few examples of my work on it for like the last five or six years. And um, you can't really see it on there, but I've, I've used all sorts of technologies. So um, I've used like lily pads, uh, different Arduinos, um, embeds, um, uh, AT tinies, etc. Um, and my work is all basically around uh, visualising data. 
I'm also a PhD researcher at Goldsmiths in the uh, Department of Computing and um, I'm, I'm peering into the world of wearable technology through a lens looking at uh, um, body language and social circumstances and how wearable technology can, can help us visualise our data and uh, what it says about us. Um, something else I do, I also run a lot of uh, workshops and I, um, I really enjoy teaching people about code and electronics and um, try to engage people in, in pursuing their own projects and, and how they can become empowered by um, doing a little bit of studying and, uh, and <coughs> experimenting. And um, here's a few examples of, of classes that I've run at um, like Abbott and Goldsmiths and different things I've, I've done in the past. I think it's really important that, um, that people can express themselves through wearable technology rather than just um, following a pattern or following what they think wearable technology should be or, or how it should be. And um, some, some of the things that have come out of that have um, been, been so lovely where, where people were just so um, surprised that, that by uh, shifting around a few blocks of code and playing around with uh, a few components, they can actually do something for themselves rather than just um, use wearable technology that's off the shelf. I think there's, as um, Eleanor was saying earlier, we've, we just recycle so much, we, we don't repurpose it. And, um, and I love to, to encourage people to think about what they can do with it for themselves. Um, so, so here I've got some little pads, which really was one of the first vectors for me to get into wearable technology. It was the, the approachability of this technology, the, the open sourceness of it, the way that it wasn't hard and sharp and boring and hidden. It was actually a technology that I could wear on the front of something that I made, that I actually like wearing. And it was such a, a good idea, the lily pad, that, that there's been a few more versions of it and it, it spawned a whole...